Please take your seats. On Good Friday, we focus all of our attention on one historical event, something that happened on one day in history, that is the crucifixion of a man named Jesus that they called the Christ, crucifixion by Roman soldiers at the insistence of Jewish religious leaders. We focus all of our attention on this day, on that one event. And we do that because we know as Christians the significance of that event. We know that the death of Jesus Christ was the sacrifice that God the Son made to settle the justice of God the Father against the sin of all mankind. And so we know, as we reflect on those scriptures, we know that the reason for the mockery of Jesus, the reason for the beatings, the whippings, for his staggering with the cross to Golgotha, the reason for his crucifixion, it was not as a result, the unfortunate result of an injustice, it was the deliberate absorbing of the outpoured anger of God against the sin of mankind that had been transferred onto Jesus at that time. And we know, therefore, that the greatest obstacle standing between mankind and God, between you and I and God, has now been removed. And everyone and anyone who believes in that, who holds to that dearly, is now considered part of the family of God, citizens of the kingdom of God from now until eternity. Amen? Amen. That's why it is called Good Friday, absolutely. And that's why we focus all our attention on that event all those years ago, every year. But I've had a question in my mind these past few weeks leading up to this Good Friday, a question around the exact purpose of our particular celebration of Good Friday. In other words, what the question that has been in my mind is why do we set aside a special service on this day, Friday? Uh, you know, we have, we have this holiday and we have this opportunity together and, and thank the Lord that we get to do this today, amen, with a lot more people. We've got guys gathered at home. But why do we take this one moment to reflect back on that event that happened, you know, 2,000 years ago. What's the purpose of it has been the question. Is it, is it for nostalgic reasons that we do this? In other words, we do this kind of to look back and to reminisce and perhaps stir up some sort of nostalgic remembrance. Is it to pay tribute kind of like a religious pilgrimage where once a year we come and pay tribute and say thank you to Jesus for what he's done. Is it purely to remember and not forget what he did? You know, as though like all oh, year we forgot and then like, oh yeah, that, that's why we do what we do. And all of those things are, are good. But I would say that the remembrance and the gratitude and even the stirring up the affection and the nostalgia around that event is really what we do most Sundays and especially communion. We're going to celebrate communion today. That's largely what communion is about, is reminding ourselves. I suppose the deeper part of that question for me is simply the thought that this event, the crucifixion of Jesus, happened... 2,000 years ago in the past, we know as Christians that that event changed our eternal future, but what is the present day significance of that event? Or put it like this, just bear with me as, as I'm thinking through this. We reflect on this day, 
which was the culmination, Jesus' central purpose, the entire, the central reason that he came to earth was ultimately to suffer and die on our behalf. Now he's completed that. He died, he was resurrected, he has ascended, it is finished, job done. And so, like the, the question in my mind is, so, so what is he doing now? Is he just up there, job done, taking a back seat? I mean, he came, he lived, taught us by example how to live, gave us a bunch of incredible teachings, fulfilled his eternal purpose in dying. But now what, I suppose? What I'm really getting at is this one question, what is Jesus, God the Son, doing now? What's he up to up there? Because we look back on this event and it seems like his role has been completed. He now takes a step back, says, Holy Spirit, it's your turn. You go out there and I'm just going to hang out here in the back and watch over what's happening. What is the role of God the Son right now? And what I want to share with you this morning is that the events of Good Friday, truly historical events, as in they were lodged in the past as real events that happened, and also truly complete, as in never again will a sacrifice like this ever be necessary again. What I want to share with you this morning is that those events are still now, currently, as in this very second, this minute, being actively applied to our present day lives by Jesus. In other words, what I'm saying is, turns out, Jesus is not in the background saying my job is done. He is currently seated at the right hand of God the Father and very active on our behalf in applying the effects or the results of everything that happened on Good Friday to our lives today. What I'm talking about is a, the idea of Jesus as our intercessor. It's kind of one of our doctrines, some of the, one of the things that we believe as Christians, the doctrine of Jesus as our intercessor. And it's not something that we often talk about at church, but I've come to realize that it's critical in our, get this, in our functional view of Jesus today, what Jesus is doing this very second. So I want us to unpack this doctrine a little bit this morning, and then we'll, we'll apply it and hopefully experience it. So to understand it, we're going to turn to the book of Hebrews. So Hebrews, turn there so long, you got your Bibles with you. Those of you at home, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to look at verse 25 this morning. And just while you're turning there, let me just give you a quick bearing on uh, where we are in the Bible. So the book of Hebrews was written pretty much to show that the entire Old Testament sacrificial system, the temple, the priests, the robes, the altar, the sacrifices, the blood, that that whole system was just a blueprint for the reality which would be Jesus Christ. He would become the temple and he would become the high priest and he would become the sacrifice. And so the book of Hebrews is telling us that. He fulfills all of that. And in chapter 7, it's telling us how Jesus is the fulfillment of the priestly office. And so it says in verse 23, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. And then here's our verse that we're going to focus on this morning. Consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always 
lives to make intercession for us. So if you're following the argument here, what the writer is saying is that it's comparing Jesus to all these other, other priests who were all very limited because they just all kept on dying. You're like, what's up with that? You know, you have a priest and then dies and then you have to get another priest. And between the first priest, Aaron, and Jesus, 83 different priests and what this writer is saying. No, there's no more need for that because Jesus lives now continuously. So he's our great high priest and he's now always living now to make intercession for us. It's telling us he's still functioning in that way right now. And that's what we want to talk about this morning, what that means when we say Jesus is currently active, acting as an intercessor for us right now. So the first point I want to make about this is that Jesus' current role as intercessor is entirely, intrinsically, completely connected to what he did on Good Friday, to his crucifixion and his death. It's entirely connected to that event. So I was telling a, a, a friend of mine, who's a, it's a very learned Bible scholar and a great teacher of the Bible, and I was just telling him, I was preaching on Good Friday on Hebrews 7, verse 25, just messaged him. And I said, oh, hey, that sounds like an Easter Sunday message. And I was like, uh, yes, <laughs> correct. And to be honest with you guys, just between you guys and me, it actually was originally going to be my Easter Sunday message. Busted. But the reason that I'm doing it today is because this role of Jesus as our intercessor, this priestly role that he's still playing right now, is connected entirely to the events of Good Friday, but it is now about applying the effects, the results of that event to our everyday lives. In other words, when we talk about Jesus' active role, today, not in the background, at the front, actively involved as intercessor. We're not saying his job description changed, like he kind of, he did the dying thing. He's now retired from that. That was his entire purpose. And he's up in heaven and he's like a little bit bored. You know, I still got some time and goes to God the Father you know, like, what else can I do? And God says, well, I mean, I don't know. Why don't you just go do a couple more miracles, you know, amuse the people down there? It's not like his role substantially changed. He's saying that he's active today at the front, but what he is doing is connected to what he did 2,000 years ago to his very central purpose. And whenever you come across this idea of Jesus, our intercessor in Scripture, and you come across it often, now oh, we missed it. You won't unsee it now. But whenever you come across this idea of Jesus and his current role as our intercessor, it is always tied to what he did 2,000 years ago, to his death. For example, Isaiah chapter 53, which is, a phenomenal Good Friday passage. Almost every year when it comes to Good Friday, in the Bible, I'm gonna preach on Isaiah 53 this year, and I never do, but I always swing it in somewhere because it's this beautiful passage for Good Friday. So for example, Isaiah 53, I mean, you'll, you'll know this, I think. This prediction of the death of Jesus, it, it says in verse three, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from, mo from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for 
our iniquities, this is just great Good Friday stuff, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. Amen? And then right, verse 12, a few verses on, it says this, yet he bore the sin of many, yes, that's Good Friday, and now makes intercession for us. This is the current job description of God the Son. Completed the great assignment of suffering and dying in our place, and now his job is to constantly, daily apply it to our ordinary, our ordinary everyday lives. That's what it means to say. Jesus is interceding for us. Maybe one more point before we get on to what this means for us about this idea of Jesus, our intercessor. To be clear, and we need to be clear here, what I'm not saying is that Jesus is still now paying for our sins. That has happened. It is done. It is finished. Let me say it again. Never again. Will there need to be another sacrifice for the sin of humanity? It is finished. His role as intercessor is not dying again. It is applying to our lives his death. All good? Make sense? All right. Good job, team. I realize this is heavy stuff for a public holiday Friday. Now let's talk about what that means for us now. And this is the fun part. What does it mean to say Jesus is currently, right now, interceding for us? Firstly, what it's saying is that he is in the very real present tense constantly expressing his love for us. And I know that seems kind of obvious, but hey, let's just think about this for a little bit. So you read the Gospels and you see Jesus on earth and you see how he loved people. You see how he went to the sinner and how he welcomed them in, how he embraced them, how he helped them move away from that embrace with dignity, with shame, having been removed from them. How he sought out the sinner. We see Jesus and his compassion for the sick, For the poor, how he alleviated the needs of the poor, how he showed concern and protection for those that he loved. And we see Jesus and we go, look how he loved them. And then we see him go to the cross and we know that what drove him to the cross was his love for us. And he endured the cross because he loved us, but... Now he rose and has ascended and is in heaven. Now what? Is he, again, is he in the background and now sort of indifferent to us? But when we read, he always lives to make intercession For us, it means that that same beating heart of Jesus, that visible representation of God the Father, when we see how he loved them and the love that drove him to the cross to say he now is making intercession for us, means that same beating heart is reverberating out to us right now which is really good news because we as human beings need continuous reminders of his love for us, don't we? We constantly need to know how he loves us because 
we constantly fail. So to say he always lives to make intercession for us is because we always live to make mistakes. And oh boy, do we need these constant reminders of his love for us because just wonder, does he still love me? Has he grown tired of me by now, surely? And I mean, we know again on Good Friday, we cast our minds back to those 2,000 years ago and know that when he was on that cross, that it was my sin. We sing those words, it was my sin that was there. And so therefore he loved us. But it doesn't really help me with my current experience of does he still feel that way towards me now? And to say Jesus always lives to make intercession for us is saying he's not in the background. His love is not in the background. He is dispensing his love to us right now. Pastor Dane Ortland, he puts it like this. He says, fallen, anxious sinners are limitless in their capacity to perceive reasons for Jesus to cast them out. You just keep thinking of ways of reasons why Jesus would be done with us. We are factories of fresh resistances to Christ's love. Go, no, 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 you just, surely not. Even when we run out of tangible reasons to be cast out, such as specific sins or failures, we tend to retain a vague sense that given enough time, Jesus will finally grow tired of us and hold us at arm's length. But now we know because he is always living to make intercession for us. You don't have to wonder if he still loves you. He's still telling us today that same love that held him to that cross 2,000 years ago is beating in his heart for us right now. You can know you're loved and you can know you are forgiven. So this is a question that I get asked a lot as a pastor, in different ways, but it's this idea of, hey, as I'm a Christian, I've believed in Jesus, I've declared that I've been baptized, for example, but I know that every time I, I sin or fall, I've got to ask for forgiveness. So what happens if, you know, between my last confession, so now at church I confess, and then kind of on the way home of this massive arguments like in the car with my wife. I mean, that never happens, right? You know. And then like on the way, I mean, it's really a morbid story, but I, I die. And I haven't yet had a chance to ask forgiveness for that sin I just committed. Like what happens then? Am I toast? I mean, it's a very real question. So we know we're supposed to repent and ask for forgiveness. And what this verse is telling us is that Jesus is always living to make intercession for us. He's always applying in a very real sense forgiveness to our current mistakes and failures. And it's based on what he did 2,000 years ago. He purchased the right to absolve us, to forgive us. And he is right now forgiving you, forgiving me for everything we're doing, mostly without us even knowing about it. That is an objective truth. You are forgiven. You will be forgiven. The subjective experience of that forgiveness, in other words, the feeling of release, that load of shame and that guilt being removed from me, that comes through this repentance, asking for forgiveness and receiving that. But the question of whether you are forgiving, this verse tells us he is always living to make intercession for us every moment of every day, covering every mistake. That would have been a good time for an amen. Just imagine the people at home are saying amen like crazy. <laughs> That's the first thing it means. Number two, it means he's currently <laughs> rescuing us. 
So the word for save there, that he's able to save to the uttermost, save, we, we mostly use it in a sense of salvation, becoming a Christian, which is the central, most important idea behind the word. But in the New Testament, the word for save is used more generally than that as a, as a rescue, whenever you need help. For example, rescue from danger. The disciples in the boat, a massive storm comes. They think they're gonna die. They wake Jesus up because he's sleeping. They say, Jesus, save us. They're not saying save our souls because we're about to die. They're going, stop this, like help us, help. The woman who was bleeding for 12 years, she sneaks up to Jesus in that crowd and she says, I just hope I can touch his robe and he will save me. She means that he will stop this debilitating illness. He'll re- he will rescue me from my sickness. It's the same thing that the demon-possessed man. Remember that story where Jesus casts out the demons into the herd of pigs? It says that he went away, he was saved. He was rescued from demonic oppression. That's what the word save in the New Testament has all of that range of meaning. And so to say Jesus always lives to make intercession for me means that right now he is able to deliver or rescue us. Now you might say, if you're thinking with me, that wait, that's not entirely connected to the 2,000 years ago, which remember I made a big point about that. But just hang on a second. Remember that the cause of all of these disruptions, of all of these difficulties, the demonic oppression, the tumultuous creation events, disease or sickness is a result of sin. None of that existed before sin. So Jesus on the cross deals with the root cause of all of that affliction, which means that what he was able to do then in calming storms, in healing people, in delivering them from demonic oppression, he's able to do now. No, let me say he's even more able to do now because the root cause of it has been dealt with. And to say Jesus is always living to make intercession for me means that right here, right now, he is discharging the results of his victory 2,000 years ago into our present day reality. You guys are getting it. Absolutely, amen. We don't just gather together today and remember a victory 2,000 years ago. The results of that are being applied to our present day lives because he's alive in heaven, not in the background, in the foreground, at the right hand of God the Father, applying these effects to our everyday lives. Number three, he is helping or he's currently building our faith or maintaining our faith despite persecution or opposition. So this actually comes out in the whole book of Hebrews, the purpose for which it was written um, then and, and for our purposes today was written to Jewish Christians. So Jews who had become Christians and were now persecuted in Rome and they were tempted to leave the Christian faith and become Jews again because that was legal and they'd be safe. And the writer to the Hebrews is trying to go, no, 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 don't go back to that. That's empty. Now stay here. This is where the life is. And and by the way, Jesus is currently in your persecution, in your opposition. He is interceding for you. It's a very real present day application of this. He's interceding for you, for your faith. It reminds me of what Jesus said to Peter while he was on earth. Luke 22. some of the scariest words in scripture. Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. You are coming against intense persecution and opposition, but I'm praying for you, Peter. The word praying for and interceding, we use them interchangeably, and that's correct because intercede means to go to someone on behalf of another. That's what we're doing when we're praying. And so you go, well, that's great for Peter, but see, remember, we're saying, no, that same Jesus 
is now currently actively interceding for us right now. How does it change your life? How does it change your thinking to know that Jesus is praying for you, for your faith? I mean, in today's culture, and it's only going to get harder, guys, in this anti-Christian secular culture, it's only going to get worse. I mean, it's really hard, but to know that he is praying for us to build our faith despite opposition. Robert Murray McShane, the pioneer missionary to America, he said this, he said, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Well, he's not in the next room doing that. He always lives to make intercession for us. He's doing it right now. And the perseverance that drove him through the cross he is now dispensing and discharging that to us as we go through our opposition and our persecution. Because, say it with me now, this time, he always lives to make intercession for us. So I think I've said enough on this subject. So much more that I could say, would love to say. But let's take some time now to actually experience this. So you'll notice in the service, we flipped it around a little bit, preaching up front, and now we've got a, a time of worship. And the aim for that is between the songs of worship, I'm gonna come up and lead us in time of prayer, so worship team can come up so long. And the aim of that is, is for, to give us some space to actually allow this to settle from our heads and from the truth of the scriptures into our hearts and then beyond that to actually open ourselves up to just ask Jesus, if what I'm saying is true, and I really believe it is, hope it is, from the scriptures, then, then he's right now waiting to apply the effects of what happened 2,000 years ago to our very lives right now. And so there'll be opportunity to pray to those at home. If you're on the Go Life platform, you can click pray for. There'll be people waiting to pray for you. To those of you here, at any of the moments of prayer between songs, if you'd like to come forward, there's opportunity for you to, to kneel here. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, we'll pray with you. We'll stay where you are, but I'll guide you in the time of prayer. And the purpose is not to prescribe exactly what's gonna happen. It's actually just to give us some space to allow ourselves to experience this truth. And it may happen really tangibly right now, or tomorrow when you wake up, or Easter Sunday at the sunrise service, because everything magical happens at the sunrise service. But opportunity for us to actually allow Jesus, who's alive, and wanting to demonstrate and apply these things to our lives. So let's do that and start by singing together. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.